This video is on the second of the big questions on the things that can go wrong in a regression model or the pitfalls. And so this big question is whether there is omitted variables bias. And this is covered in section 6.4.2 of the book. Okay, so uh, let's start off and ask who among these two was the better player? So uh, many of you might recognize this guy. This is Charles Barkley. Some consider him to be one of the 25 best players ever. And this, well, uh, at least if you're one of my students and you can recognize who this is, then I'll give you 4.9 imaginary bonus points. And the reason I say 4.9 is because I believe that was his career scoring average. Okay, but uh, if you run a regression, something like this, championships equals beta zero plus beta one times Barkley plus beta two times Will Purdue, this is Will Purdue here, uh, what you're going to get is a zero for Barkley and a four for Will Purdue. Will Purdue had four championships, Barkley had zero, even though he was one of those top players ever and Purdue was just the bench warmer. Okay, so uh, what is going on? What's happening is that there are some there are some huge omitted factors here, uh, which includes Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen. That's who Will Purdue played for, with uh, when he was on the Chicago Bulls and won three championships. And then you can add Tim Duncan and David Robinson to that, his teammates when he played for the San Antonio Spurs one year for a championship. Okay, and Barkley never had anyone like that uh, on, on his teams. And so basically, uh, Will Purdue, in this little model here, Will Purdue would be getting credited for the effects of the omitted factors, the omitted factors being Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen. And that's really what omitted variables bias is about. So when you have some regression, uh, y equals, let's say, beta 0 plus beta 1 times x1, maybe you can have some other control variables. There is omitted variables bias when some other variable, let's call it x2, is not included in the model. Maybe it's just uh, not observed. Maybe it's not quantif uh, quantifiable. Uh, it has an effect on the dependent variable y, and it's correlated with the variable x1 that is in the model, not solely because x1 affects x2. Okay, if in this case, uh, not solely due to x1 affecting x2. If that's the case, then, then it's a mediating factor. And we learned in a prior video that you don't want to control for mediating factors. Okay, so let's take this example. You're trying to estimate how years of schooling affects income. And let's think of that omitted factor as innate intelligence. Well, innate intelligence, it's really non-quantifiable, so it's not in the model. It probably does affect the outcome income. And it probably would be correlated with X1, not because education affects innate intelligence, probably the other way around. Okay, and so there would be omitted variables bias in this model, and the years of schooling would be getting credit for the effects of innate intelligence. Okay, so when I think of omitted variables bias, I like to think of this great quote by Yogi Berra. And he says, I never blame myself when I'm not hitting. I just blame the bat. And if it keeps up, I change bats. After all, I know it's not my fault that I'm not hitting. How can I get mad at myself? I'm sure Yogi was thinking regression analysis and trying to teach us a lesson when he was giving us all these great quotes. So. What's going on here is that there is some omitted factor, and we don't know exactly what, the, what that omitted factor is. Maybe he's distracted. Uh, may, maybe he's just in a general slump. He's just not hitting well at a given time, but he's trying to he's trying to uh, blame it on some tangible factor. The tangible factor is his bat. Okay, and and so again, that's that is what omitted variables bias is about. It's where the observed variable is getting blamed for or credited with the effects of that unobserved variable or that unobserved factor. Okay, so there are two main causes of omitted variables bias. I call it OVB. Uh, one is um, spurious correlation. So there's some unobservable factor that systematically affects both that key X variable X1 and the dependent variable Y. Okay, that's the easier one to deal with. The not so easy one is incidental correlation, where it's due to the key X variable being correlated with some unobservable factor that affects the outcome just by coincidence. That is, that is the key X variable is correlated with that unobservable factor by coincidence. And I'll give you examples of both of these. 
Okay, so here's an example of omitted variables bias from spurious correlation. So let's say we're trying to estimate how does oat bran, which is basically oatmeal consumption, affect a person's cholesterol. So this was uh, a theory a couple decades ago or so that people thought that, that hey, we should eat more oat bran because it can reduce your cholesterol and thus reduce cardiovascular disease. So what we're interested in is A, the value of A. A would be the average effect of increasing your oat bran consumption by one unit on your cholesterol level. Okay, and so, so your regression might look something like this, where you're, you're regressing cholesterol on oat bran consumption and maybe some other X variables. Uh, but the problem is that there is something that's, that is non-quantifiable. There's concern for healthy living. And that concern for healthy living might cause a person to eat more oat bran. There's fiber in oat, oatmeal and other things. And also through other methods, maybe in the amount or the quality of exercise or the quality of the other foods that they eat, it could affect their cholesterol as well. And my guess is that a stronger concern for healthy living would lead to greater oatmeal consumption and would probably lead to lower cholesterol. Okay, and so the direction of the bias on beta 1, you're on your estimate for beta 1, the effects of oat bran, would be the product of the direction of these two effects. So here, there's a positive effect of uh, concern for healthy living on oat bran, B is greater than zero. There's a negative effect, likely, on cholesterol, C is less than zero. And so if my theory is correct here, that B is greater than zero and C is less than zero, then it's likely that it's going to be a negative bias on our estimated effect of beta-1. So, so if you estimate beta-1 to be negative, you do not know if it's because A is truly negative, that oat brand does reduce cholesterol, or if it's due to this omitted variables bias uh, based on the product of B and C being negative. All right, here's an example of omitted variables bias due to incidental correlation. And so I'm going to look here at the effect of the top U.S. marginal income tax rate on the unemployment rate and on real GDP growth over 23 years, 1991 to 2003. And what I plot here, in red I have the top marginal tax rate. Okay, so uh, it was low, fairly low in um, the, the first Bush years, and then Clinton raised it up to 39.6%. Uh, and then it got dropped by the second Bush, and then I believe it was Obama who then raised it again a little bit. Uh, so it was really high in those in the 1990s. Uh, in the 1990s, well, that was the dot-com boom when the unemployment rate here in blue dropped a whole bunch. Okay, and then it just happens that the unemployment rate uh, was happened to be very high for part of that period when the tax rate was relatively low at 35% in the Bush years. And that, that was basically the financial crisis right around here. Okay, so um, if you do a regression, then you get this right here. Uh, so here's the unemployment rate as the dependent variable, and here's the top tax rate. Okay, so we normally think that a higher tax rate leads to higher unemployment and lower economic growth. Okay, but here we're finding the opposite that the higher tax rate is associated or is, is estimated to cause a lower unemployment rate and a higher growth rate. And the likely cause of this is going to be here, omitted variables bias due to incidental correlation. And I'll show you why that's the case. Okay, so, so this is our objective, estimate the effective tax rate on real GDP growth. A represents the effective increase in the tax rate by one unit or say one percentage point on real GDP growth. We could put unemployment rate there as well. It's the same general idea. Okay, so there is this unobserved factor, and I'm just going to call it internet business creation. So basically the, the, the um, business boom from the dot-com era, from the dot-com boom. And that probably had a positive effect on real GDP growth. Okay, and it just so happened that the internet business creation occurred at a time when the tax rate was relatively high at that 
And it's not because of any systematic uh, effect one way or the other, but rather I think they were just incidentally correlated, correlated by coincidence. Okay, and pos it was a positive correlation. That's a Greek letter rho. Okay, and so because you cannot control for the internet business creation, it means that your estimated effect of taxes is picking up the effects of the internet boom. Okay, and so because this correlation here is positive, and because this effect is positive, there's probably going to be a positive bias on the estimated effect of the tax rate on real GDP growth. And it would be the inverse of, uh, of the effect of the tax rate on the unemployment rate, where here C would be negative, there'd be a negative bias from omitted variables bias, and that's why we saw that negative and significant estimate. Okay, so what's happening here is that the higher tax rate is getting credited with the effects of the internet business creation. Okay, to check for omitted variables bias, there are three main steps. First, just think, what are the main factors causing variation in the key X variable? Then which of those, if any, can you not adequately control for? And could those factors that you can't control for affect the dependent variable? Those are your three steps. So let's take that example of how does TV hours for children affect their body mass index, the example we've been working with. So the first question, what causes variation in the key X variable or in TV hours? Well, many things. There is the weather. Weather could cause people to watch more TV. If the parents are busy, very busy, if the parents are very strict, uh, that could affect TV hours. Probably the busier the parents are, it could lead to more TV hours. The more strict parents are, maybe that means less hours. The intellectual health consciousness of parents, okay, well, that could also lead to uh, less TV hours if they're afraid that TV would warp their children's minds. Uh, the laziness of the child, that actually could be due to the child's weight. And then demographics, age, gender, race, ethnicity, and so on. Okay, well, which can you not adequately control for out of these factors? Okay, and there's probably other factors I'm missing here. Well, basically, all these factors you can't really control for well except for the demographics here. Okay, and then could those factors affect BMI? Well, well yes, I think that all of these could, could have an impact to some extent on, on body mass index. Okay, and that's how you would suspect that you might have limited variable spies. It's very hard to prove that you have it, but you can have some good um, suspicion or reason for believing that you might or might not have limited variable spies. Okay, let's take a very relevant and important issue uh, for today of how to do state shelter in place policies affect the state unemployment or just affecting um, state economic growth. And for that matter, national economic growth. Okay, so the first question, what causes variation in the key X variable or the shelter in place policies? Well, here are a couple of things. It could be the political party of the state leadership, uh, the pandemic itself so far in the state, and um, projections perhaps of the pandemic's unknown potential and how concerned people are as a result of that. Okay, well then what can't be adequately controlled for? So the pandemic itself in the state, at least up to that point, uh, yeah, there's gonna be some numbers on how many infections there are, but that's not gonna be a very perfect number. That's gonna have a lot of error in it because of many people who just aren't getting tested. Uh, but here's something that isn't even going to be quantifiable, the pandemic's unknown potential and people's concern in the state. Okay, and then Third, could those affect the state unemployment rate? Uh, yes, certainly they could. So, so um, if a pandemic has some big po unknown potential, if people are concerned about that, then, then people are going to do their own self-imposed social distancing and, and sheltering in place. And it's not because of the state shelter in place policy, but it could just be due to people making their own decisions on how to be safe. Okay, and so in the end, Really, it's, it's near impossible to distinguish between the economic effects from the shelter-in-place policies and the effects of people taking caution themselves, people doing what they need to to be safe. And so really, we shouldn't pretend like we can determine 
or calculate what's the effect of the shelter in place policies. You can probably get a good sense of, well, what's the effect of the whole pandemic and the policies that result from that, but just knowing what the effects of the state shelter in place policies or social distancing policies are, that's going to be very difficult to identify. Okay, so this method of checking for omitted variables bias can also work uh, when you're dealing with omitted variables bias from incidental correlation. So let's take that tax rate and real GDP growth example. Okay, and so the question becomes, well, what one thing causes variation in the tax rate? And basically, it's going to be the year. Every year, there's a different tax rate. And then the question is, are there factors in specific years that affect real GDP growth? Yeah, of course there are, okay? And the thing is, with a time series model like this, you really can't control for the year because if you control for the year, you control for what the tax rate is every single year. And so when you estimate something like this, there's certainly going to be uh, omitted variables bias. And this is how you identify it. Same set of questions. All right, what is not an indicator of omitted variables bias? Uh, if there is a low R squared, or just some people might say, hey, there are other things that could affect the outcome. That is not an indicator of omitted variables bias. The, the other things that could affect the outcome have to be correlated with that key X variable. And again, not because the key X variable affects them. If the omitted variable is just a moderating factor, giving information on how that key X variable affects the outcome differently for different people or different entities, okay? Uh, so think of it as, okay, um, the effect of college isn't the same for everybody or for people who go to different colleges. And this is okay, this is not omitted variables bias, it's just that um, the moderating factors are part of the average effect. If the omitted variable is a product of the key X variable, that's the case where there's a mediate, it's a mediating factor, or maybe it's an outcome itself. This is going to be big questions five and six. Okay, uh, that's not an indicator of omitted variables bias either. Okay, and then what is quasi omitted variables bias? Well, it's probably not going to be in your textbook because I just created the term. And what I mean by that is that it occurs when you inadequately control for an important factor that is correlated with the key X variable and affects the Y, affects the outcome. Okay, so you're controlling for it, but you're not controlling for it adequately. And that happens a lot. Even though people don't know what quasi-omitted variables bias is, they know that, hey, they're often not able to adequately control for something. And that's why this is a not so secret secret in the research community that this quasi omitted variable bias is very common. And so perhaps the better terminology to use is that uh, when we have categorical variables like, uh, like what professor it is or race ethnicity when there's a categorical variable, well, we actually control for those categorical variables and we probably do it adequately, okay? But when there's interval variables, something like the AFQT score, years of schooling or income, if we were to control for that, well, we really don't control for it. The best we can say is that we attempt to adjust for those variables, and there's probably going to be that quasi-omitted variables bias. Okay, so in summary, this uh, represents big question two, omitted variables bias. And if it's present, then what that means is that uh, it is presenting some alternative story and another reason why two variables, the KX variable and the dependent variable, may be moving together. And if it's not ruled out, then, then that's something that's going to get in the way of you being able to claim, hey, this coefficient estimate is an unbiased estimator for the true causal effect. Okay, next video will be on self-selection bias.